Well, look, Matt, it, I, I have to tell you straight right off the bat, um, this is uh, a, a treat for me getting to talk to you right now. Um, I can tell you, I, I've been playing your game since I was in, ju in, in junior high, um, fifth, sixth, seventh, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, um, on that, that, that general area for me. I don't know how I discovered it originally. I think I was just enamored with the SmackDown versus Raw GM mode, and I was looking for wrestling booking games to play, and I was able to uh, convince my mom to uh, let me pick up, um, uh, I believe it was uh, Federation Booker was the first one. <laughs> oh, but this one. That one, yeah. <laughs> Oh, those were the days, yeah, back when it was a CD, and uh, yeah, we've come a long way since then. That, that's why I wanted to talk to you, because it's always good to talk to people that go that far back, because they can appreciate the evolution that it took to, to get this far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of your older games um, a little bit in depth. There's just a few things that I'd personally like to know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the way that I, I really wanted to start this out was something that caught my eye back earlier in 2020 was your YouTube channel, which I am a subscriber to, oh, hit you. the 100,000 subscriber mark. Yeah. And you posted a video, um, and I believe the quote was, the quote you, you kind of selected for that was, if you don't like the story life is telling you, tell life a different story. And that, that, that definitely hit home to me. I'd never heard anything like that before. Mm -hmm. um, after I watched that video in my office, I, I wrote down a sticky note. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote, I wrote the quote on a sticky note, I should say, and I, I taped it to uh, my computer. You know, of course, life started telling me a different story when, um, you know, we, um, when my work changed significantly due to COVID nineteen and eventually yeah. got laid off. But, um, but I, 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 there's something very profound to that. So, I, I want to give you the floor to just kind of elaborate that on that a little bit and um, just kind of break down what you, what you meant by that. Well, that's, that's definitely how I felt about YouTube because YouTube had traditionally, historically been this cause of anguish for me where people trolled me, ridiculed me in front of thousands of people back in the day when my games weren't played by thousands of people. So imagine, you know, the idea that 50,000 people hate you and a thousand people like you. And it was a real, it was a real cause of anxiety. And so what meant so much to me about that award was the idea that when that logo was read, it kind of made me uncomfortable. And but through hard work and through a conscious decision to change how people feel about it, I turned that into a silver award. And that meant a lot to me because I could have sat there and taken the abuse or I could confront it in the middle of the ring and say, I'm going to harness this better than my enemies and I'm going to kind of like um, turn the tide on them and turn it into a source of good and a, and, a, and a source of positivity in my own life. And that's what it's become. It's become this hub where I have access to 100,000 people and, and I can trust them to kind of set the right tone going forward. And, and that's a very powerful uh, tool in, in my business now. Yeah, that, that, that makes plenty of sense to me. I know you've, you've spoken candidly in, in past interviews about the negativity you received from, well, I guess you can't call them fans, but you know, consumers and yeah. the media alike. Um, but that being said, I remember in, um, when we chatted for the uh, other website I was working for back about five or six years ago. Yeah, I remember. Um, you mentioned um, how much you enjoy facing with your fans and how you set time time aside every day to answer emails. Yeah. Um, is that kind of still the case? And also, how do you deal with the neg that negativity? Because I, you know, in preparation for this interview, I, I went back in your Facebook page and looked at all the updates you posted leading up to Wrestling Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and the top comment for all of them was just, you know, some sort of negative post. Um, was whether it, it was. Well, well, there's your answer is I don't even know because I don't even go looking. You know, I, I just realized, you know, pretty early on that there's no happiness to be found there. First, it was the YouTube comments section I disappeared from. Then it was the Facebook comments I disappeared from. Then it was the Twitter mentions I shied away from. And um, so what was your original question before we were talking about that? Oh, oh, oh. No. Yeah, actually, yeah. Whether I, whether I still talk to the fans, yeah, that's all I've been doing on the first day of this Wrestling Empire release through emails. I've been, I've kind of like feel like I've gone through... Um, 
three different New Year's Eves. I've had one midnight in Australia, one in Europe, one in, in America. And I've kind of stayed up and, and felt and, and felt the excitement of each culture uh, coming into my email inbox. And I've been replying to people uh, and kind of educating them on what needs to be educated on. And that's been overwhelmingly positive. So I think I've reached a point in my career where where I, I'm, I'm quite insulated from all the negative things. They don't get to me. They don't reach me. If, if someone doesn't write a very polite email, it doesn't get to me. So um, I, I'm just not aware of these kind of text messages that end up on, on, on social media. Um, and I'm a lot happier for it as well. It's, it, was a import, it was an important change to make because it did used to drive me crazy. I'm quite sensitive person. I'm quite, uh, I'm quite um, sensitive to any criticism. So to be surrounded by that 24 hours a day, I wasn't the right person for it. And I'm a lot happier to take one step back from it. Makes a lot of sense to me. It was just crazy though. I, you know, you're, a lot of like real innovations came with this game, your, your latest release. And, you know, all I'm seeing are just demand, not even requests, demands that people are making um, right. for older stuff. Well, I'm glad to be insulated from that because all I've received on the email is very positive so far. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite happy with that feedback. But but of course, now I have to juggle different audiences because, of course, the Nintendo audience is going to be happy now. But now I have to rope in the iPhone audience and the Android audience and the PC audience and kind of bring them all together in one dysfunctional family and try and please everybody, which is going to be difficult. But we'll try. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that was something that's been talked about ad nauseum on podcasts like the Joe Rogan Experience, for example, mm -hmm. um, just you know, how unhealthy it is to, yeah. to pay attention to the negativity. Um, that, that, that is really right in front, right under your nose. Yeah. Um, and I noticed you, you incorporated, a, a, a caricature of, of Joe and his, uh, his podcast. Right? Yeah. I quite enjoyed that. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it was, is there any kind of influence there for you? With Joe Rogan or with podcasts or with, uh, with, a uh, JRE. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a huge, it's kind of like on in the background while I'm working. That's like my radio show. I just kind of like let it hum in the background. And uh, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in all aspects of it from the MMA side of things to the fitness side of things and and to the um, the cultural side of things where I, I do take a lot of inspiration from Joe Rogan for changing the conversation where, where like, like me and you right now, I feel this is happening because of Joe Rogan, because he made it OK for me and you to have a conversation and trust ourselves uh, and not, because in the old days, this would have, I would have had to wait for a mainstream newspaper or magazine to take an interest in me. And that, you know, hardly ever happened. And then I would have to trust them to do a good job of reporting on it, which hardly ever happened. And now all it is is a civil conversation between you and I, and what happens to it is in our hands. And, and I, I credit, people like Joe Rogan for making that possible. And I respect them for, for, for making that possible. The conversations in our hands. And mm -hmm. as a listener, I can go back to this and I can take so much from, from just two people talking now. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing I'll, I'll this, it, for me that a show like that is good to put on when I go to sleep. Um, because it's amazing the amount of information I can just retain, you know, yeah. while REM. It's, it's, it's crazy. And that's another thing. He's given a platform to so many people that we would never have heard about. I mean, and I'm very excited that he even spoke to um, a lot of game designers. And, and I, I never would have I, I imagined we'd sit there listening to John Carmack talk about Doom for an hour and a half with Joe Rogan in front of millions of people. I could never conceive of that 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, I, I give people like that a lot of respect for, for just showing us what is possible. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember um, an episode where he and Duncan Trussell talked about, you know, wanting to start a land party for StarCraft. I thought yeah. that was that was pretty cool. Are there any, um, you know, episodes that kind of stick out to you that you, that you most enjoyed? Um, the, as I said, the John Carmack one. Anything, anything about technology, computer games, um, anything about history as well. Um, was it Graham Hancock? I think he has an alternative view of history and. Um, and anything to do with religion and spirituality is, 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 is so many different things are in my wheelhouse. There's kind of a lot of shared interests um, and then anything with fitness and jujitsu and, um, and just health and 
yeah, every, any, anything like that. It, it, is, it takes a lot of boxes for me, yeah. Yeah, a lot in your wheelhouse, and I think that's also evident in the sheer variety of games you produced yeah. over the years. Yeah, that, that's important to me as well, because um, I, I know people would love me to stick to wrestling, but the irony is, when I disappear to make something else, I always bring something back to wrestling that wouldn't have been there if I didn't experiment. And, and, and you could go back to like the, the severed limbs and the, the amount of gore that, that hasn't been seen in a wrestling game before. That, that's because I disappear and I do make those more violent games. Uh, and, then I, and then I come back and, and we're gonna see it with Wrestling Empire. We're gonna see how I'm, I, make, I make a game like School Days or Hard Time and I bring that free roaming thing back to wrestling. And you're gonna see it come full circle in 2021. You're gonna see wrestling benefit from all the other things I tried. And so, yeah, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, I could specifically um, think of the influence that came from the uh, the Weekend Warriors game. Oh, you know, yeah. so many, and, and just my, my limited time playing the game, um, so many mixed martial arts influences and the smooth transitions on the ground. It really, and that's that's kind of in part and parcel what makes Wrestling Empire, I think, your most polished effort yet yeah, on day one. Oh, oh, definitely, yeah. I, I did, I did feel the benefit of of um, the MMA game because the I didn't feel the MMA game was successful in itself. It, I wasn't happy with the way it worked out, but I was happy with the bones I could pick out of it and, and make wrestling better. I made wrestling more um, chain based, more chain wrestling, more transition based. Uh, not to to say nothing of a wider variety of holds and moves. And I, I'm only halfway through them now um, for Wrestling Empire. There's still loads of moves from Weekend Warriors I haven't reprogrammed for this new game yet and I'm looking forward to doing so yeah yeah me too mm -hmm. um so let's um let's shift gears for a second I kind of want to take uh take our viewers kind of back to the the beginning the genesis of uh M. Dickey games um um just talk to me a little bit about your influences and and what it was like growing up um I know you're from uh I, I'm not sure which part of England you're from but just just tell me what maybe what your childhood was like uh maybe what your parents were like um, just to give the listeners a bit of insight into that. Well, I was I was raised in the north of England, and my mother and father owned a shop, a, a newspaper shop. And they were so busy with that that I would often sit in the back of the shop, and I would be so bored that I would make my own games, uh, even if it was out of cardboard, because there's a lot of cardboard in a shop from all the boxes of sweets, boxes of newspapers, boxes of magazines, all the old cardboard. I would chop it up and either make board games with it or make physical box games with it and um and that naturally evolved into computer games when i got my hand up, hands on a computer when, when i was a teenager and so it's interesting how the the seeds were already there the idea of entertaining oneself of entertaining other people what does or doesn't work as soon as i got a computer i just hit the ground running okay now i'm going to do the computer version of all of that doom, 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 doom. And even to this day, you'd be surprised how much of Wrestling Empire is this exact same logic, the exact same statistics that I was, the exact same mathematics that I was messing around with when I was like eight years old. Um, the exact same strength, skill, agility, stamina, the, the exact same relationship between them, the, the exact same uh, 50 to 99% range. It, it was all, It's all been with me through about 30 years now. And this is just the culmination of it. Yeah, I remember you mentioned to me that, that you got you kind of got your start in video games by just just making games in general. But mm. you know, did not know that your your parents uh, uh, ran the paper um, yeah. and produced that. So is that? Do you think that is kind of where the the newspaper clippings aspect um, comes in your wrestling games? So yeah, it's, I've never thought of it that way. That the the my obsession with newspapers and games could be linked back to my childhood of being surrounded by newspapers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, a, not a bad idea. Um, but it's, it's mainly linked to having to find some way of expressing that things are changing on a weekly basis. And um, I, I can't remember where I got the idea from actually. It must have been stolen from some game or another that, that uh, I, actually a lot of football games, uh, soccer games I played in England, um, they had kind of weekly news reports. It wasn't in the same graphical format, but it was a weekly news report of how football teams had changed from one week to another. And a lot of what I did with wrestling was inspired by that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that seems to make sense. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to talk about the uh, 
football, soccer, as we as we call it in America, uh, influence um, on your games. Um, you know, we I know you made a you made grassroots. Um, uh, what were your what were your, kind of your uh, your thoughts on that process? Well, um, I when I was a kid, playing football wasn't this big professional experience. It was it was me and my friends at a park kicking around a ball however and wherever we found ourselves and i always wanted to make a game that was that freewheeling that free roaming that that kind of um spontaneous and i also wanted to make a, a sports game that was very character driven just like i do with wrestling wrestling you could take that to any sport and make it character driven and make them argue and make them have storylines make them have angles you can do that with any any sport so i thought let's bring the conventions of wrestling to another sport like football let's make it um where anything could happen at any moment and see what happens but unfortunately the gameplay wasn't wasn't up to the up to to do justice to the concept because it takes a long time to master a sport you know i've made a lot of wrestling games i've made the same game a dozen times but i only made one football game so the chances of me getting it right first time were very small and whereas all the big companies they've been through that evolution they've made the same game a dozen times and they've got their concept they've got their gameplay and i never quite got the evolution going to to build a good a, a good game out of it um so i just kind of left it to other people and then fifa made fifa street and that was kind of that's it it's done now so I, I i really don't like doing what other people have done it, it all enthusiasm leaves me instantly do you think you'd ever revisit that concept again i mean there's so many football games in the world on mobile i just couldn't compete I, I couldn't compete with the gameplay of the of the top tier games I, I could i could do something unusual i could do something strange but i couldn't do something playable yeah it's that's a tough one right because fifa's gameplay is so much fun mm -hmm. that i think that you know it's a game that you know personally i i like soccer i like i i enjoy following the uh the ins and outs of, of the world leagues but you know that's a game i could take to a non-soccer fan and they could have a good time with it and then yeah. for someone else like me, you know, who enjoys the managerial aspect of it, football manager is about as in-depth as it gets. I don't know how they get more in-depth with those games. They they keep finding ways, though. Yeah, no, they've been going a long time. I was playing those in 1993. I was playing, um, I think it was called Championship Manager. Yeah, they've, they've been around longer than I have. So um, that's where I get my inspiration from. Yeah. So do you have a favorite club then? Well, um I don't, I used to when I was a kid, but I don't like, um, what's it called, domestic football now. I, I don't, I like international football. I like countries against other countries. I, I I can't get excited about a city that I probably have never lived in or been to. It doesn't feel the same to me, especially with the players uh, changing so regularly. There's no kind of, kind of a loyalty from me there, but I do get excited about international football. I always watch the World Cups and the European Championships and things like that. You know, I had no idea um, that uh, football games, as you mentioned, have, have had such an influence on the wrestling side mm -hmm. of things. But you started making wrestling games for a reason. It's kind of your bread and butter. Um, where did the wrestling fandom come from for you? Well, there's two different fandoms. When I was a 10-year-old, it was The Ultimate Warrior, a, man, a Macho Man, uh, and Hulk Hogan. Just when I saw these larger-than-life superhero-like characters, like, what, what is this? Who are they? how could somebody look like that in real life and then then when i revisited it revisited it again as an adult in 1998 it was uh, for slightly different reasons i suddenly became more interested in the politics of this of this choreographed entertainment like it, it might not be real inside the ring but there's something real happening backstage that that decides that steve austin is now the champion and, and why is he going to drop it to this guy and i became fascinated with that aspect of it more so than what happened in the ring and and you can tell with my games that that's where my interest lies is in is in peeking behind the curtain and exposing it as much as we can yeah yeah that's something that that's that i can definitely relate to although um for me, that, that that the timeline of both kind of were ran closer together. It was, but that's also because the internet was such a, you know, so prevalent by 2005, 2006. That all you had to do was Google WWE SmackDown, and the second thing that would come up is spoilers. Oh, why is there spoilers for this show I'm gonna watch <laughs> on Thursday? You know what I mean? Yeah. And 
if I'm going to read this, what what's the point of what, you know, and you come to realize that there's way more to this than meets the eye. And, and that is something that sort of, you know, prolonged my interest yeah. in it over the years. Well, for a long time, even when I wasn't watching the product, even when I wasn't a fan of WWE, I was still watch, uh, reading the news religiously on a daily basis. It's amazing to, that I was studying the news every day of something I do not watch, of a TV show I do not watch. And so, right. yeah, it's, it, that's just a testament to how, and, and again, now with the podcasts, you know, you, the reason, um, what's he called, Comrade Thompson's been so successful with all his podcasts is there's yeah. such a nostalgia for, for analyzing every second of the past that we grew up in. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a fan of Conrad's podcast? Yeah. I mean, through osmosis, he shows up on my YouTube feed on a daily basis. So um, yeah, I have to say I'm a fan of, of, of grilling JR and... Um, something to wrestle with and 83 weeks as well as Jim Cornette's uh, experience. And, uh, Oh, what else? I used to listen to the Steve Austin podcast, but he seems to have disappeared or, or something. I don't know what happened with that. He, he's, he's kind of, uh, uh, rolled it back a little bit. Yeah. All it is is old episodes. And I kind of, I kind of like, uh, wondered where he'd gone, but, um, I think he's, uh, yeah. he does it for WWE exclusively now or something. Yeah, I think that's that's what it's got to do with it. Um, yeah, I'm a fan as well. I'm not a fan of the way the uh, the Pritchard show has gone um, since Bruce went back to WWE, but yeah. I feel like Grilling Jr. has sort of taken that mantle. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he's the one that can be objective now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a great idea to, to to get him going with that because his podcast before was just like anybody else's, and now, you know, it's something that I'm that is weekly required listening for yeah, someone yeah. like me. And that's why I wanted to add it to the game as well. It was becoming such a big part of the culture that I knew I had to make some reference to podcasts in the games. And I, I'm even happy that I managed to find a way to make it work because you literally do answer questions about yourself like a quiz. And it really does make you more or less popular. So I'm, I'm glad I managed to include pod podcasts and elevate it above a gimmick to be a legitimate part of being a wrestler. It's definitely one of my favorite um, in-between week happenings now. It's mm -hmm. one that I've gotten a lot. Just I think I've played through about four months of the game. All right. But uh, my, one of my personal favorite uh, anecdotes on there was um, I think I was talking to, um, I guess it was Brother Love, and he <laughs> asked, um, who, who, would, who do you support to um, uh, run the free world, the 80-year-old yeah. uh, the, the blue idiot or the 80-year-old <laughs> idiot? Yeah. I, that that hit home so hard right now. Yeah, that was that was my attempt to be um yeah to cause as much trouble as possible because uh, yeah I just criticized both of them in one sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and I feel like your games have kind of kind of accomplished that. They've sort of rocked the boat a little bit. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I I sit in the middle, so I'm just pr I'm just um, proud of being objective, and I, I'm not for one side or the other, and I, I I just reserve the right to just roast anybody for any reason at any moment, and I enjoy that freedom. I would never give up that freedom for anything or anyone. Yeah, it, it has a very um, South Park. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly my attitude. Is um yeah, it's that kind of sense of humor. It's got scorched earth, roasting everybody. No one's safe. Um, that's my sense of humor, and uh, you either <laughs> you can either tolerate it or you can't. But... Yeah, well, I think that shines through so well in your games. Um, and actually, one of the games I wanted to ask you about kind of jumping around here again um one of the more unorthodox games i think you've ever done would be uh the m dickey show oh. so where did the idea kind of come from to uh to put forth a game about a talk show that is also kind of a wrestling and fighting game well the, the idea i actually stole from eminem in, in one of his raps he said i'm gonna take you on jerry springer and beat your ass legally and i thought oh that's not just a joke or a rap that's a game <laughs> i'm gonna take you on jerry yeah. springer and it's gonna be a fighting game and the other half of it was I couldn't make a proper fighting game. I couldn't make a proper wrestling game. So I had to compromise and make something that's halfway a fighting game. And, and that is in a chat show format. They suddenly start fighting a little bit. And um, so the expectations are lower for a fighting game in that environment. And whereas I made a wrestling game after that. So it was a stepping stone to a full wrestling game. Yeah, the, some of the... Um... Some of the uh, dialogue in that game is so funny. 
And I don't think there's been a game done quite like it ever since, quite frankly. Yeah, it was uh, definitely of its time. I, I, I don't think I would want to revisit it now um, because I, I just think it's too easy to offend people now. Um, and that was that was another one of my scorched earth, trying to uh, offend as many people as possible, trying to make fun of as many things as possible. And I just don't think it works in, in this climate. Yeah, if, if people haven't already, they should they should go to YouTube and, and check out some of the uh, some of the dialogue from that game. It is it's something. I'll, I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, uh, it, it gave me a sore throat because I remember having to record it all myself because I didn't know any voice actors or anything when I was yeah. that young, and so uh, I didn't enjoy recording it. You know, it gave me a sore throat every day. Yeah. That actually segues to uh, another thing I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, I could I could kind of tell like in, in talking to you and hearing your interviews that oh yeah he must have done the voices for that as well. But um, one thing that struck me about the new game is how how well done a lot of the sound effects are and how how you know real they sound. So when it comes to you know emulating a a, a choking um, animation or when it comes to you know, mimicking the sound of a steel chair hitting someone in the head. How do you kind of, you know, gather those sounds together and, and, and produce them for a game like this? Well, the boring answer is, is that you, you can buy them nowadays. You can buy a set of, of uh, there's quite a big industry around providing sound effects for people that need them for movies and games and things. And But there is still an engineering aspect to it because the sound is never perfect for your purposes. You always have to, um, see what's available, bring it in, edit it, shorten it, crop it, combine it with another sound. And it, it gets quite comical sometimes because sometimes it is it is me kind of um, breaking a cucumber or something ridiculous in front of a microphone uh, just to add an extra crunch to something. Um, but I, I quite enjoy that aspect. That's the that's the good thing about doing this on my own is I, I, have, I wear so many different hats every day. One minute, one minute I'm... I'm recording sound effects or engineering them and then the next thing next day I'm doing art and then the day after that I'm doing programming so um, I never get bored uh, in this job yeah no that that, that makes uh, plenty of sense to me um, um, now transitioning back towards uh, the, the 2d like I mentioned one of the first games of yours I ever played was Federation Booker it was 2d um, now you've you're one of the only developers that I can think of off the top of my head that's made the transition from 2D to 3D on multiple occasions. Yeah. Um, what was sort of the motivation for wanting to do it the first time on the PC platform, and then you know kind of transitioning back into the into the mobile? Um, what with the success that you saw with your 2D game, why go 3D on that? Um, well, I, I always do 2D first when it's the only option available to me because 3D doesn't immediately present itself, especially on a mobile. Um, uh, even when I did make a 3D mobile app in 2014, you know, the average game could only handle a one-on-one -on -one, uh, match. Whereas with 2D, you've always got that freedom to throw in more characters, to do more things. And it can actually be easier to make a 2D game because anything you've got a picture of can be in the game within minutes. Whereas in 3D, things have to physically exist in three dimensions. And it's, it's like, it's the difference between recording a Disney, uh, animating a Disney animation or directing live actors on, on, a, on a movie set. Some things are easier in one and, and, and harder in the other and vice versa. So I'm always collecting these pros and cons from each project across different decades, across different platforms. But it's usually dictated by what a device can handle. Because um, now we've come to the Nintendo Switch and that can handle my 3D games um, better than anything we've seen on mobile so far. And so that was a, another, another liberating thing to kind of step things up a notch and double the resolution and double the frame rate. And yeah, so we're seeing the benefits of that as well. Yeah, I, and I, I think to your point about 2D, you know, it, there's there's a lot of ways to, you know, broach that. And, you know, one thing that I've seen, you know, just to put my um, video game hat on here for a second, um, you know, there's standard 2D, you know, um, Federation Booker was that. When you took that to mobile, though, it kind of, to me, had 
it, it was more of a, a lively environment. It was kind of like what we saw Rare do with the Donkey Kong Country games, where it is a 2D game, but it tricks you sometimes because you have essentially animate the sprites being so animated that it, it kind of, you know, you forget that you're playing a 2D game at times and you remember that, oh, I'm just playing a really great game. No, oh, thank you. Uh, but another another connection is that I did literally take screenshots of the 3D game. That Wrestling Revolution 2D is screenshots of Wrestling Empire 2008. So I would, yeah, I would mm -hmm. take photos, uh, not the photos, screenshots of all the body parts, cut them up, and then put them back together as 2D characters, these 2D puppets. And um, yeah, that's how that started being made. So it was this real hybrid of, of 3D assets used as 2D assets for a 2D game. So I can see why you felt that. Yeah, yeah, well... I think I think maybe that you know lent to some of the uh, success. You know, in addition to just mobile being a better fit for you. So let's talk about that for a second here. Um, you mentioned to me in our chat a few years ago that you, when you were on PC, although it was the way I discovered your games, you didn't feel that you were getting out what you were putting into it. Um, yeah. You want to kind of explain that to the audience? Um, well, it was it was literally true that. Uh if you worked out how many hours I was working versus what I was being paid, it was, I was earning less than the minimum wage at, at some points. And I was, this literally wasn't getting out what I put in. And, and we can talk about the reasons for that. You know, the, on, on every platform, there's this kind of complacency where, where um, piracy kind of creeps in and people stop buying the games and it becomes, but the, the problem with having such a, an enthusiastic fan base is that um, they're very smart and and they they will when when you're playing a, a game from a different developer each year it, there's no connection between them but when you're playing games from the same developer twice a year this kind of complacency creeps in where you feel you you know all all the tricks you know how to, how to get these games for free and, and that happened to both PC and to Android games. And the sad truth is it, it's a surefire way of killing a, a platform and killing my enthusiasm for developing for that platform. And uh, it's happened twice now. And one of the most exciting things about the Nintendo release is that that's, um, it's gonna be a lot harder to see that fall apart. And uh, it feels a lot, a lot more secure already. I already feel so much better to be surrounded by people that have invested in the game and, and that it means enough to them to buy it um yeah i feel it's it's um i mean i appreciate all the people that do of course there's thousands of people that do buy the android games did buy the pc games and i feel sorry for them that i can't do more for them because they do deserve more but at the same time the the simple economics of it uh, doesn't always make sense well that's an excellent point about the uh about the switch mm -hmm. um because I'm, I'm sure as you know uh, Nintendo has a long, lengthy history of um, going to extreme, like the drastic measures to prevent piracy, um, yeah. piracy, I should say. <laughs> um, you know, that's I think that's part of the reason why they kept the uh, the N sixty four on cartridges and and they wouldn't yeah. do the deal with Sony where they were going to make a disc a disc system and that's kind of what led to the creation of the PlayStation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I do feel a lot more secure in this environment. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's one of the reasons I made the switch to the switch is, is the, it's just, yeah, it's much more secure. Yeah. Well, well, we'll talk about what a great fit. I think that plat, that, uh, mm. that, uh, that console is for your games now. Um, but one, one, one more thing I wanted to touch on before we kind of took that next step was I, I there's one more game I got to ask you about from your, your 3d PC days. And, and that's the U Testament. Mm hmm. And I just thought that, you know, that, that's a game I had a lot of fun with. It it really, you know, kind of explores the open world aspect that you talk about. Um, where did you get the idea to make a Jesus Christ simulator? Well, I've, that, that, um, that period in history fascinates me. And it, it always, and what fascinated me more was the idea that you're not allowed to make games about this. We're allowed to have movies about it we're allowed to have books about it we're allowed to write songs about it but for some reason we're not allowed to have interactive stories about it and whenever i'm not allowed to do something that that's a pretty surefire way of making me turn up and um, I, i've always 
I've always engaged with religion through entertainment. I've always watched movies about it. And um, yeah, I never, I just never accepted that I can't make a game about it because for me, it, it can have a lot of benefits to make something interactive, to, to really understand what it means to forgive someone who's hurting you, to, to, to understand what it means to... My, my favorite part of that game is when you have to deny Jesus because you know you're going to get your ass kicked by some Roman soldiers. That's, that's a very real uh, kind of dilemma that somebody would have faced in those days. And, and, and I enjoyed exploring it in both 2D and 3D. The 2D one was uh, much more successful. I, I would call the 3D one a, a kind of um, a, a botched attempt to do that. Whereas the 2D one, um, I consider, I'm a lot prouder of. I, I, I think, um, and, and a lot of people are, are shared my enthusiasm for that one. It was a lot more successful. It's played by about 3 million people with um, an 80% approval rating, which is fine by me. It was a big improvement from last time. Yeah, for a game like that, I think I think you'll take eighty percent to the bank and be happy with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I would say that you know, and that's a game I had a lot of fun with. Um, even three D, um, but especially two D, like you mentioned. But I would say it's 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 um, not a game that's really been done and tackled since. But have you seen the trailer to this I Am Jesus Christ game that's coming out on Steam? Yeah, I did. I did see that trailer. Um, I, I hope I hope it's a legitimate game because one of the things I wanted to accomplish with the U Testament was not about me making a game about those that period. It was I wanted to make it palatable for someone like Rockstar to make a game about that period? Because I, I had a dream once that there was a game about the life of Moses and it was as good as Red Dead Redemption. The graphics were as good as Red Dead and it was as playable as Red Dead. And I'd like to think that could still happen, not in my hands, but in the hands of somebody else. Just, I just like this idea that there's nothing you're not allowed to make a game about. And if, if there's a historical period, um, a biblical period that somebody wants to make a game about, a, a mind-blowing piece of entertainment, uh, then I'd like to think that's possible. I'd like to be part of making it possible. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that it's it's funny the way that religion has a way of you know riling people up mm. because when the trailer to that game came out for the first time and now they're way further into development but the mere teaser of that trailer you know made all the major news outlets here in america and uh i think that's you know exactly the kind of press that they wanted and and now it looks to me like it's it's on its way to becoming a legitimate game um yeah it's, it's crazy to me though yeah i but yeah, pe people assume that you're making fun of religion whenever you make a game about it or, or, or the other way. They assume you're being preachy about it. You, you kind of can't win, you know, um, whereas with me, it was neither. It, my, mine wasn't orthodox enough to be preachy and it wasn't it wasn't critical enough to be blasphemous. So I, I tried to stay the middle path where I'm trying to make a, an entertaining um, game with a philosophical edge to it uh, and i believe it deserves to exist and and i believe i i'm qualified to give it a try and and yeah. I, I wish luck to anybody else who uh, who wants to take a sincere attempt at it because no nobody does yeah. this for fun no no nobody does this I, I didn't spend six months of my life uh to mock christianity um i could have i could have done that in three minutes i could have mocked jesus in three minutes with a with a very depraved game uh, that was obviously not my intention i spent six months um churning out something that was a bit more considered that's a great point although i i i, I do have to tell you that after having played in the m dickey uh show first to then come to the u testament i was expecting you know a bit of a spoof but i have to tell you it was it was a really by the book experience, and I felt like I came out of it having learned a thing or two. Oh, thank you. I, I hope so. There are a couple of jokes in there, um, mainly stolen from Monty Python, uh, The Life yeah. of Brian. Yeah, I've got a sense of humor, and uh, and um, I believe relig religious people had a sense of humor as well. Uh, I believe God has a sense of humor, so I've, I've got no problem with that. Yeah, um, you know, segueing back into uh, into the mobile space. Um, one thing I do have to ask you about that kind of pertains to the, the future of, of video games 
and something that I think we're starting to see more and more is developers really taking liberties with the way of the uh, the internet and the power of patches and updates and releasing what are essentially broken games or incomplete games or beta versions of, of what we come to see as the final game. Now, I don't have that um, – I've never had that um, that take on any of your games. You you seem to produce a um, a full experience that someone can have. Someone can have a lot of fun with it, and then everything else on top of that is just gravy. There yeah, are you... times though where I, I do feel like I'm being shortchanged, and you know the the one that comes to mind immediately right off the bat is uh, the uh, last WWE 2K game that came out. What a, just what yeah. a disaster that was. We don't have to spend any time on that. Yeah. But I do think that it's especially with with the way cyberpunk is gone and all the all the news surrounding that. I think it's a, a conversation worth having about the future of video games. What do you think about that? Well, I'm not exempt from it myself because Wrestling Empire is the closest I've come to what you're talking about of, of releasing a game that is not quite there yet. Because this is only a third of what I wanted to accomplish in 2020, but the way 2020 went. Um, it just wasn't happening. I was I was here homeschooling two children and I was working a part-time schedule. So this is only a fraction of what I had planned for Wrestling Empire's debut. So you could call this incomplete. And there was a day one patch um, for, for me as well. And, and there's still more to come. Uh, but And the, problem, the reason so many of us are in that situation now is that games are just getting harder and harder to make, longer and longer to make. And so when someone like WWE commits to a year an annual schedule that is unsustainable that is out of this world and so um and so you it's going to see it more and more often until until people accept that games do take longer to make and um i don't know how you balance the books in that instance um because your time is money is the cliche and uh, the longer you spend making a game the more money it has to make so it's a vicious circle where You've got microtransactions filling in the gaps of all this extra time that's gone into a game that's too big and couldn't be. F and the, the irony is, it couldn't be finished. So it's, yeah, it's a very messy little circle that's going on. Yeah, as it pertains to the WWE games, I think they're going to have to take a long, hard look at, you know, what what they want to get out of their games and what what people want to get out of their games and is it worthwhile to you know do a yearly release because that game was just such such a disaster it was it, it made worst game of the year on several you know video game youtubers that don't even like wrestling yeah but it was it was you know such a, a glitch fest and it, really a broken game mm -hmm. um the uh the cyberpunk situation on older hardware you know is kind of like that as well um and you know I, i'm someone that you know played a lot of animal crossing earlier in the pandemic and um, I don't want to say they they shortchanged people in any way, but they you know they 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 really add they really almost doubled the size of that game um, since its release and you know is that right or wrong I I, I don't know I it, it's a moral dilemma I think that a lot of people are having and I think that's why the Switch has become so successful is because the Switch knows what it is and it's is really leaning into these games that are easier to make and easier to digest. And so while the PlayStation 4 and all, and all the next-gen consoles, while they overreach, the Nintendo, the Nintendo Switch and the mobiles are just going to sit there in the middle, um, just staying in their lane and accomplishing what they set out to do, putting one foot in front of the other. And I think people are gravitating towards that. I mean, that's been my experience of, of day one of Wrestling Empire is I've never had such an overwhelmingly positive response from people in this perfect storm of being dissatisfied with WWE, impatient for AEW, and then finding me in the middle and just like a safe haven, being so grateful to just find something that works, something that's affordable, something that loads quickly. Um, yeah. What have you made of the, uh, the AEW video game um, presentation, what they've shown so far? My initial reaction is is that they're in the they've got the same problem as WWE Battlegrounds, which is that they're half pregnant with this um, cartoony visuals thing because they haven't they 
they're getting all the criticism of being cartoony with none of the benefits because they haven't leaned into it being low poly. They haven't leaned into it um, that that thing is going to be just as difficult to render. It's going to weigh gigabytes. It's still um, it's still not going to have more than four or five characters in the ring. You'll be lucky if it comes to the Switch. So they've got all the criticism of being cartoony with none of the benefits of it actually being quick to load, quick to download, and, and all these benefits that, that that I'm getting out of Wrestling Empire. And so when I look at the A, what I've seen of the AA, AEW game is, is very similar to the same mistakes that WWE Battlegrounds made, made which is, um, yeah, all the criticism and none of the benefits. Whereas, yeah. whereas what their fan base wants is that AKI, uh, Aki, all those N64 games that were low poly. Um, and they, if, what I'm saying is, I think it would be better in 2020 to have no mercy with no limits. And what I, what I mean by that is just no mercy that, that loads instantly and has lots of characters and, and, and is quick to download and is not expensive to make. And, and so I had to tick all of those boxes myself with my attempt at it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I agree. It's something that I thought of as well. When I saw the trailer for that game, it, you know, I looked at it and I was like, well, I see what they're trying to do. I know mm -hmm. what they're trying to do. They, it's been talked about ad nauseum, but this, it, the look of it is really neither fish nor fowl. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want And to I think say. that's one thing that your games have done a great job of. And, you know, what WWE games historically had done a great job of up until just a couple of years ago. Yeah. But to be fair, they, they can't really do what I did because they would be slaughtered if they made a game that looked like mine. Uh, they, they, their fans do have a higher expectation. Um, but um, yeah, it's, just, it's just a shame that they can't kind of embrace the benefits of modern technology because I, I would have been happy if games never got better than Street Fighter 4, never got better than Grand Theft Auto 4, but just worked perfectly. I'd be perfectly happy. That, I'm, I'm fine with how they look. Um, I... I, I'm I'm very skeptical of games that weigh gigabytes and and they still take ages to load in the year 2021. Um, I, I just I, I think by now we should be seeing things that just work and work smoothly and work quickly and aren't expensive. Things should be getting better, not worse. Yeah, another thing I'll say about a lot of your games is they tend to have a long lifespan because of how easily moddable mm -hmm. they are. Um, and, you know, pe there's different extremes that people will take that to. Uh, myself, personally, like um, one, one thing I will say about um, uh, some of your PC efforts would be that um, there's only so much you can make a certain character look like said character unless you find textures that people put together and put them in. And then you can really, you know, run wild with it and you can really yeah. do whatever you want. And if I'm creating my own character... If there's a specific texture or you know shirt design that I want to have, I can have it. What do you make of the idea that that, that people have kind of added to the uh, lifespan of your games through the modding community? Um, yeah, it's a shame I can't do more to support it because there is that thin line between modding and piracy, and it always oversteps, no matter how no matter how good their intentions are. You know, I, when I released the Steam version, I, I included a modding guide and it said, oh, okay, I've made it as easy as possible to mod this game, but please play it through Steam. This is very naive. Please play it through Steam. Please don't pirate the game. And and the story of the Steam game is that it, 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 sold, um, a, it sold a lot on day one and it sold zero on day two. And you don't need to be a genius to work out why that was. And it's a shame because... Um, you know, I, I, I got my start modding games, so I'd be very hypocritical to stamp stamp it out too much. Um, I, I got my start pulling apart the sprites of Fire Pro Wrestling. So I'm, I'm all in favor of modding as an educational tool, as for someone's own private amusement, but I have to draw the line at public um, public redistribution of, 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 of code and de deciding for yourself that somebody's hard work is open source all of a sudden. Um, it's, it's, it's a conflict within my community, but um, I just can't find a, the right the right path through it. Yeah, modding modding's definitely a tough one because, like you said, there's such a thin line between piracy and modding. Mm -hmm. and, and in a lot of cases, it really does go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. 
personally, I, I, I think it's a great a great thing for your games that it's, it is so easy to get in there and understand the way the files work because um, there's there's so much more you can do with it that, that'll really just, you know, capture your imagination, suspend your disbelief, which I think is really the crux of what have made your games work over the years. Yeah. I think the best compromise for me would be if all of that happened after I was gone. Uh, when it happens while I'm here, it's kind of it's kind of a bit of a conflict. But when, yeah. if, if if I so I'm happy to see it on games like Wrestling Empire 2008, where I'm gone, the project's gone, it's not for sale. But then when people kind of decided for themselves that Wrestling Revolution 3D is open source now, we're just going to randomly decide that, and and the and the the game dies a pretty swift death thereafter. Um, it's a it's a real conflict and. Um, uh, I think it's partly my fault as well because I don't have the infrastructure to give them a proper way of importing new textures. Because of course people want to make their own t-shirts and make their own arenas just like Fire Pro does and, and like WWE does. But I don't have the infrastructure and the servers to kind of make that possible. And yeah, if I did, that would be the that would be the middle ground where it's, it's, it's perfectly easy for you to import your own things to the official game. That would be the compromise, but I'm not capable of it at the moment. Yeah. Um, you've spoken about No Mercy to this point and the Fire Pro series. Um, you know, I, I think your games kind of kind of take a lot from both. Um, which of those, though, would you say has been most influential on you? Definitely um, the N64 games. I, I would Instead of um, always going to No Mercy, I would actually say NWO Revenge means the most to me personally because that that came out of nowhere for me i had no expectations and i'm suddenly sat in front of this massively deep um wrestling game that's extremely customizable so the shock factor of discovering nwa revenge in 1998 meant more to me than no mercy um but yeah definitely that those 3d wrestling games and when i say fire pro i'm, I'm talking about the super nintendo fire pro as well because that's i discovered it in 1992 i think on the super nintendo and so yeah, that's why I'm so proud to be um, developing for a Nintendo console now because I was there playing on the Super Nintendo. I was there playing on an N64. And to fast forward 20 years and to see my own games on the same platform serving the same purpose for a new generation uh, has been quite profound for me. Yeah, and um, you know I've got plenty to ask you about that. Um, right before I get into that, though, um, another thing that I did want to ask you briefly touched on before, you know, this COVID-19 um, pandemic mm -hmm. has affected people in a number of different ways. Most for the most for the bad. But I think that the people that, you know, um, that get to work at home anyway, you know, conventional thought would say, oh, this is actually going to be a good thing for them. They're going to be able to get more done. They're already adept at working from home. A, a lot of people had to learn how to work from home uh, during this time. And there was a learning curve there. But. You know, for you, you mentioned that you were able to actually only get a third done of what you planned on doing in 2020. Yeah. So, um, you know, I find that really interesting. Well, um, yeah, we, we were one of those statistics that was indirectly affected by COVID because um, um, a lot of people in my family were severe, were extremely ill uh, with things that had nothing to do with COVID, but we still had to uh, go in and out of hospitals on a weekly basis um, while homeschooling two children when friends and family can't come within two meters of supporting you. So um, it was undoubtedly the most stressful year of my life um, before I even started making the biggest project of my career. And so, yeah, I was juggling a lot of balls in 2020 and um, yeah, even I had to tap out and say, I'm not going to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish this year. Yeah, I, I think that's something that a lot of people had to had to um, come to terms with. And um, uh, it's good that you did. And, and, and with all that being said, we've got a, a wonderful game here um, on day one that, that people could pick up and play. Um, and as I segue into, into all the questions that I have about that, um, the first thing I have to ask you is what drew you to the switch in the first place? Cause I remember the, the day you posted the, uh, the first picture of your game on the switch. I was like, Oh, now, now we've got something here. <laughs> well, I'd spent, 
well, basically, I was retired in 2019, and I spent that whole summer um, playing Mario Odyssey for fun. Just for the first time in, in a long time, I played a game for fun, not, not for work. And um, that just rejuvenated my love of games, of, of playing games, and then that rejuvenated my desire to make games, especially if the Nintendo Switch could be one of them. And, and uh, well, when I... Um, just the the, appl the application process was a story in itself because I I first applied um, when I when because I, I live in Europe when I because I live in England everything I applied for was sent to Nintendo Europe and and they they weren't huge wrestling fans and they were like no 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 this isn't happening and so I was like hmm. I was like shocked because I thought oh no no this has to happen I have the answer to this problem i have to i have to make this game so i had to hustle and i looked on youtube and there was this guy giving a speech to nintendo employees and i looked him up on twitter and his dms were open i slid into those dms and said um you've got to talk to the people i need someone from america to go to bat for me in europe and and let them know that i i have a wrestling game that, that needs to be made that, that belongs on this console and so through it, through this indirect assistance of an American uh, Nintendo employee, I got the European office to accept my request. And then I finally got this opportunity to develop for the console. But um, it could have very easily um, never happened. Um, a, a, a normal person would have given up at that point. But um, yeah, I just couldn't let it go. And I, I hustled for, for um, an alternative. And uh, yeah, I, I, I got my development kit and... Uh, and then that was a whole other year-long learning process because it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to master a, a console with different controllers and, and, and different configurations and my first time making a game for a console of that stature. And um, yeah, so something went wrong every day. Something went wrong that could have derailed this whole project. And every day that problem was solved by the end of the day. And, and I was such, such a relief to just get over the finish line. That's that's an insane story. Mm -hmm. So if I if I'm hearing you correctly, you had to get initially approved for your concept. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just to be just to be with the company, just to get a deal, just to get the permission, just to get the console, just to get the development kit. There's a whole approval process, and so it's quite a privileged position to be in. And um, yeah, it wasn't looking likely at first until. I um I kind of just um had to speak to different countries and get different countries on board with with the uh, with the concept. Yeah. Um well that's a lot better than I guess developing the game and then you know taking hey I got this wrestling game. Oh, we don't like wrestling. Oh, but yeah, also yeah. how insane is that? You know, if you look if you look on the Nintendo Wii shop, one of the great things about the Switch is that it is so good for indie developers. Yeah. And kind of really necessitated the fit for you specifically. But you scroll on there long enough, and you'll quickly find that there is a lot of junk yeah. on that store. So to just look at you know the concept of oh wrestling game, you don't <laughs> want that like that, that that's that's crazy to me. Well, that, that's something I've been struggling with um, my entire career. There's a there's a lot of um, snobbery. What's it? What, what's the word? Uh, there's um, a lot of discrimination against wrestling, where it's very looked down upon. Um, either by journalists or by award shows or, or, or by publishers even if, if someone's not a huge fan of it they think you're crazy they just think this is garbage you know and and so it's, it's a developing wrestling games is a constant kind of brotherhood of finding like-minded people i found this like-minded journalist i found this like-minded publisher it's like the secret society and we're yeah. all hustling to just try and get these projects over the finish line and and that's sadly one of the reasons why you don't see too many of them is that, um, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a it's a very um, difficult. It, it's as diff it's as difficult as the industry as the real wrestling thing used to be. It used to be very hard to find a real wrestling trainer. It used to be very hard to break into the business. And the, it's, the funny thing is, it's the same thing with wrestling games. It's very hard to break into it. Yeah, nowadays. You know, you, you, you go through, um, you know, the, these targeted ads on Facebook and Instagram, and you'll see advertisements for wrestling schools. Yeah. 
right in front of you. Yeah, that blows my mind because I would have killed for that when I, when I was a kid. Um, it was a complete mystery how you would become a wrestler when I was a kid. Completely out of out of this world. And now I'm quite jealous of seeing people that just march off to all these gyms in their local city and, and, and get started. I think I would have done it um, if I had the opportunity when I was a teenager. If, if someone had said half an hour down the road, there's a wrestling gym, I, w- I would have been there straight away. But um, Well, I, I would have loved to see the, uh, the M. Dickey run in, in WWE, <laughs> I have to say. Oh, yeah. That, that was um, one of the reasons I like to I like I like to keep fit. I like I like to pretend that if if the call ever came, that I would be able to get into the ring and just be a Shane McMahon of of, of wrestling games and and kind of like hold my own a little bit. Yeah, so I always tried to keep in shape just for that call. Yeah, but um, yeah, makes, no, not makes anymore. Now I'm too old. Now I'm legitimately the DDP of this thing, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to start now. Oh come on! Everybody's got a price. <laughs> Oh, they say yeah that's something you know with wrestling it's one of those things where you know if you get it you get it and if you don't you don't and, yeah. that, and i have to say that's a you know argument i've been having with my dad basically my entire life yeah. you know you know he's you know he looks down on it and i'm just like no it's this and this and this and you just have to understand take it for what it is and he's just like no well, that's what i'm talking about that that exact same conversation happens in publishing meetings in, in when we're trying to make games those are, that exact same mentality stops you from doing this. Um, people who don't understand it do not want to hear a single word about it. I mean, I remember when I was making Federation Booker, I, I said to the publisher, I want to make a game about the management aspect of it. And they said, nobody wants to play a game about the minutia of a niche sport. And um, I had to publish it myself and the rest is history. You know, it's you encounter these obstacles and, and you're forced to overcome them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to see that there's now several games that, that really capture, you know, the uh, the ins and outs of the backstage politics yeah. of, of wrestling so well. You know, one that comes to mind for me is obviously Total Extreme Warfare. Um, mm-hmm. Bella Britt, Adam Ryland did that one. Um, but, um, but still, even still, whether or not I, you know, if I'm on the Nintendo Europe side of things, even if I don't understand wrestling, you know, even if even if I don't like it, you know, what what is there enough there for me to now say, oh no, you can't make a game about this because I don't personally care for it, you know, when when there could be millions out there that do, and the data, you know, you, the data shows it. I mean, you've got you had your mobile your mobile numbers, and you know, it's well documented how successful those games were. Yeah, that helps as well. And I'll tell you another thing that helped was the Ouya release. Um... Because when I did start talking to to them, they said, do you have any experience um, squeezing a game onto a console? And it does so happen that I had experience with the Ouya. And um, and the irony is that used the same NVIDIA Tegra technology that the Switch uses. So it's amazing how your past can come back to serve you in, in the future because everybody laughed at me at the time and said, ha ha, this is a waste of time. Uh, uh, the worst developer ever on the worst console ever. And then fast forward to 2020, that experience got me through the door at Nintendo to develop for this console. So you can never discredit something and say it was a waste of time because you never know how it's going to come back and and help. Yeah, whenever I hear, you know, you describe yourself as the worst developer and I hear the reviews that, you know, are are negative towards you, I I just laugh because you've been on the cutting edge of, 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 you know, so many things for wrestling games for such a long time and you know i i given some of the features in the new game um i i fully expect that to continue yeah um i i i'm glad i can laugh at it now as well there was a time when i couldn't because they had a lot of power over me for a long for about 15 years people like that had had the control their not their narrative was what they said it was they controlled the narrative and it's only in the past five years that I've controlled the narrative. And um, and now it genuinely amuses me when people try to push that narrative in the mobile era, when the, the, the mobile app has been played by 50 million people, that the, this Nintendo Switch game is going well. Now they, the, men, the mental gymnastics they have to do to convince themselves that this was all a mistake and it was all a bad idea, they're going to have to spend the next 10 years arguing against that affordable, fun little Switch game. And I can't wait to see it. Yeah. So we've talked about, you know, 
why the switch was a good fit for you. And, you know, I think the proof's in the pudding. Um, mm. As far as your interest in the switch, you know, you talked about playing Mario Odyssey. Uh, I like that game quite a bit as well. I think mm. that, you know, has a case as one of the better 3D Marios. And that's, you mm. know, in a series where the original Mario 64 was one of the most influential games of all time. Yeah. So having said all that, um, are there any other Switch games that kind of piqued your interest over the years? Um, I was a bit disappointed with Breath of the Wild. I still can't. I still don't see what everyone was uh, getting excited about. Because when, when when he when he picks when you press A to pick things up and it just disappears, that disappears into your inventory. That's kind of like uh, seems a bit strange to me. I would nowadays I would expect him to literally pick things up and. There's a few things missing with that game. It wasn't as fun as Link to the Past was to me when I played it on the Super Nintendo. I was expecting something... I was expecting the Zelda version of Mario Odyssey, that kind of lively, cartoony, endlessly playable thing. And I I, I didn't quite get that from Zelda. So it's it's other games like Smash Brothers and and all the different Marios and the Mario Karts and um, even Mario Party that I play with my children and things like that. It's, it's very much a family console for me. It's um, It's not entirely a single player experience yeah for me there's so much that you can do with it um as far as you know your mario parties and your multiplayer your your smash bros um animal crossing for me is great on a flight especially um but yeah as far as breath of the wild goes i i think that art style has a ton of potential mm. um you know, I, I was never a, a huge Legend of Zelda guy myself. My room, one of my roommates is though, and you know, he said, yeah, it was, it was, it was okay, pretty much. Now I have, I have heard they're making a second one, yeah. so it'll be, it'll be interesting to me, you know, what they can kind of do with that second go around. But I think the whole, the big appeal with, of that game was just that you had pretty much had free reign to do whatever you wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, I was certainly very impressed with the world building uh, and and what they managed to squeeze onto a console, uh, a handheld console. Um, yeah, I was, technically, I'm I'm very impressed with it. But gameplay wise, I, I was a huge fan of um, the Super Nintendo one, the Link to the Past, and it's just um, it's a completely different game. I was a huge fan of Ocarina of Time as well on the N64, but this seemed like a um, a departure from the concept, in my opinion, um, and um, it's. I'm happy for the people that enjoyed it, but um, I'm not one of them yet. What were some of the challenges? You mentioned that there were several times that very minute things could have completely derailed the process. Mm -hmm. um, would you care to go into detail on what some of those may have been? Well, just um, every day there's something like trying to get the save system to work on a new console how do you save data how do you restore data okay how do i back up this data and then that that wasn't working until about two weeks before i finished the project you know things like that and then uh, and then you've got the controllers and when you pick one up and you turn one off and you turn one on how do you hold it all together when there's four people playing um how do you how do you indicate all of that on the screen and um yeah just uh, not to mention performance and has this damaged performance has that damaged performance how do i solve this problem one minute the, the funny thing is I, I was testing it in debug mode for the whole year and i thought oh god the performance is terrible i, I can only have tag team matches in this game it's going to be such a disappointment when i turned off debug mode and ran it in its full mode it could handle 30 characters and i thought oh my god this is such a new lease of life this this game is, is, is um, going to be a lot more fun because it can handle more characters. And so you're just always working within these limitations in the development process where things aren't perfect and you just gradually sculpt them into shape. Yeah, that when you talk about the, uh, the 30 people on screen at the same time, that was the moment, I think, when I, you know, in, in, in watching your development of this game where I just kind of went, wow. Okay, this this game is going to be able to offer something a little bit different. Although you've done 3D games before, um, this is going to take it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a long way to go with the 30 characters on screen because um, Unity does have a panic attack if that many audio sources are firing off at once. And I think a lot of people have seen the sound glitching um, when there's that many people in the ring. But that will be resolved. I'll find some compromise, some solution. And, and the, the good thing is that it can visually depict 
uh, 30 people. So when I do make a free roaming version of it, you will see 20 or 30 people on a street. And it's good to know that that's possible. And, and to see that it loads instantly, that's a huge, um, huge game changer for me. Yeah, I feel like that's something that, you know, people may, may take for granted. But, you know, for me, you know, it, it struck me how, how great it was to just be able to get in and out of matches seamlessly. Yeah. And, you know, if you do it the right way, you can knock off a month of your career mode in <laughs> 30 minutes to an hour if you want to. Yeah. And having the power to do that, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about the lack of loading times because e even games like Fire Pro have a little loading time when you change the character to look at them. And so to bring to bring a game like this to the Nintendo Switch and just um, and, and on mobiles as well, it doesn't have any loading times. And to just completely eradicate that from the experience, it means a lot to me because, as I said, I think that's where games should be in 2021. It should be no mercy with no limits. It should be just working smoothly quickly all the benefits of modern technology with old-fashioned games that's what i want yeah and, and personally speaking um when i think of what the perfect wrestling game would be in 2021 it's just like that it's um simplicity mm. it's uh it's it's the quick loading times and the convenience and then it's the ability to customize and make the experience literally anything you want it always cracked me up over the years when WWE would put match types into new games and then and then take them away in the next version. Yeah. Well, I've kind of done that myself because this doesn't have the War Games match that Wrestling Revolution 3D had because oh, really? I I didn't I didn't get the sense that anyone was marking out about that. Uh, people could kind of take it or leave it and it was such a hassle to add. I just thought that's not my priority here. Um, but we will see the six-sided ring come back, um, but I probably won't take it any further than that because you, you've just got to use your time properly because you've got to say what's important and what's not. Is that War Games ring important? Probably not. Let's put that month of work into something else. So it's always rearranging. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, you get to the, uh, you get to the uh, finish line and you're trying to get the game approved by Nintendo um, to go up on the eShop for release. Mm -hmm. um, this was something, you know, I was talking to you back when, when this process was ongoing. Um, what was that like, and how did you compare and contrast that to your initial dealings back with Nintendo Europe? So, yeah, there's, there's three stages to, um, to making a, bringing a game to a big console. is the, the approval at the beginning, there's the learning process in the middle and there's the approval at the end. So there's three huge hurdles you've got to overcome to get this far. And um, one of, yeah, as I was saying to you, one of the biggest uh, things that I wasn't prepared for was how long it took to approve a game that was already finished. I mean, this game, what you're playing now was finished on Halloween. So I had that on Halloween and I'm talking to Nintendo about, can we get this done before Christmas? so that people wake up to it on actually no what i said was can we hit no mercy's 20 year anniversary in the middle of november and then that became quite unrealistic and then it was are people going to wake up to this on christmas morning and then they were like no try january let's see you in january and i was like okay that's a I'm not, I'm not used to such a massive two or three month delay on some on work that's already been done. I mean, I could have made an entire game <laughs> in two months back in the day. And so to wait two months to release a game that's already finished, um, it, it's a new experience for me, but it's not entirely bad because I also got a more relaxing December than I otherwise would have otherwise had. And I got to focus on making a couple of trailers and getting the marketing right. So. It's been a learning process for me when Nintendo has said, hey, why don't you be as zen as we are and uh, you just take it easy and you just think about things a little bit more and um, let's just uh, let everything fall in its proper place. And so, yeah, it's a learning process for me as well, learning to take my time. But it's going to be a new culture for my fans to get used to where I probably only make one game per year, whereas they would have traditionally expected me to make two. Yeah. Yeah, there there may be some getting used to there, but I, I think you know they're going to be pleased with with um, the final product and just how things roll out. Um, but I can tell you that there is something novel and special to this day about 
um, getting something on Christmas morning and, mm. you know, just, just having it in your hands. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a little, maybe that's the optimist in me, but I do remember playing, um, your, uh, your 3d mobile game, um, around that time. I think that was a December release. I don't think it was Christmas per se, but maybe a couple weeks before, but you know, I, you know, as someone that's in college, you go home, you have a lot of free time on your hands. And, you know, I played that, that whole break. It was, you know, yeah, that's what that's what Def- I love. That's the good thing about mobile games and uh, including the Switch as a handheld is the it's amazing how people end up playing your games when they're on the move with it. Um, I really don't like the idea now of being um, shackled to a desk or or a console like a, the PlayStation Four or the Xbox. I'm less enthusiastic about bringing the game to those platforms, even though I have been accepted into their programs as well. Um, but something tells me it's not going to be as good a fit as the nintendo switch my my games are only popular when i've got that disclaimer to say this is the best wrestling game on the move this is the best wrestling game anyone's ever squeezed onto a mobile i always need that this dis- dis- disclaimer when i'm on a playstation or an xbox that's not going to be there and i think there's going to be a lot of criticism yeah let's talk about the trailer um <laughs> got a kick out of this um obviously um i remember seeing um uh, uh chris tanker dank ops um talking about this particular trailer and i enjoyed it quite a bit you did sort of you called it okay we're back now i, I don't know what that was um um but um yeah the spoof trailer the joke trailer as you put it uh, you chose to use uh, "Football's Coming Home" for that mm-hmm. that song. Uh, what kind of went into that decision and your decision to release essentially two trailers for the same game? Well, um, the "Football's Coming Home" thing was I always had this idea of wrestling's coming home. Wrestling's coming home to Nintendo. Wrestling that puts the fun first is coming home to Nintendo. That was my mission statement before I even applied to Nintendo. Was I want to bring that feeling from 20 years ago right back to this console right now. So, and I knew, as I said, I'm a fan of international football and I knew that song from 1996 and I knew the lyrics as well. 30 years of hurt never stopped us dreaming. And it was so, um, so similar to the wrestling fans experience of 20 years of hurt waiting for no mercy to be, to be matched. Uh, and it never stopped us dreaming and uh, we need it to come home and it was just such a perfect storm of all those emotions and 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 i I knew that was that was a song i wanted to have fun with of course it's not going to be the real trailer because i can't use a commercial song in a real trailer but i did want to make a joke trailer where i do express that sentiment uh whilst um yeah just having fun with the genre celebrating the genre as i said I had more time on my hands while I was waiting for approvals to go through and for releases to be announced. And so, yeah, I just used the time to have fun with it and do a bit more marketing than I normally would. Yeah. You know, I, I gotta say, I, I've never heard that song before myself living in America, but it kind of rips, not going <laughs> to lie. And, and I definitely get your sentiment that you could take the words, football and replace it with wrestling and it's going to make sense yeah i wish i could i i i almost um bought the instrumental and tried to record (laughs) record a wrestling's coming home version myself but it would have been horrific uh so i just thought i'm gonna throw the original song on there anyone who gets the joke gets the joke anyone who doesn't doesn't and that's that yeah reminds me of uh in love actually when uh they're like we're gonna take the words uh love and replace them with christmas (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um so actually yeah I'm, as i'm looking at the game right here um it looks like you know we got some update data um for the game already at this point yeah. um what 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 sort what so what's that going to um contain what can people look for with that it's mostly just loads of storylines that i didn't have time to um to add to the first release because of course, as I said, what you played at first was what I had on Halloween. So there was a, a whole six weeks where I was still working on it every day and adding new storylines and just tinkering with things and 
ironing out a few bugs. And um, so that, that's mostly what you'll see in the first update. And then after that, there's, we're going to go back into seeing regular move updates, lots of new moves. We're still going to see lots more uh, career opportunities. And then that will spin out, hopefully, into some free roam aspects a lot further down the line and a, uh, a booking mode. Will. So the game's actually going to triple in size at, at no extra cost, really. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and I really like the deal. You gave to uh, um, early birds this week and in, in taking the five dollars off. I wasn't expecting that. Um, I appreciated it. You know, we're all going through tough times right now, so I think that's going to resonate with your fans. Yeah, thank you. I was I was happy to do that because no nobody, uh, very few people had this on the list of games they were looking forward to in 2021. It was always AEW. It was always Virtual Basement. It was always this, that, or the other. And I, I didn't even make it onto the top 10 games that people were looking forward to in 2021. And so I wanted to give something back to the people who did know what was happening in 2021 and let them get the launch off right and let everybody else fill in the gaps. Yeah, you made it onto that list. And, you know, when I was, um, you know, checking out the uh, eShop, you know, I noticed that under games that were, you know, coming soon, because, mm -hmm. you know, you've got, great deals um and then you know games that are expected to release soon your game was you know right front and center on the list so that, that must have been pretty cool yeah yeah I, yeah I'm, I'm i'm very happy with the uh with the feedback i've gotten so far it seems to have a it seems to have a a larger audience than even i thought i i, I thought i would be on the console but hard to discover but between that trailer and all the positive enthusiasm, a lot of eyeballs have been on, on this game. And some people who never even um, knew it existed, never even played my games before. A lot of YouTubers that never even played my games when they were mobile apps or PC games. Seeing a Nintendo game has convinced them to give it a try. So, yeah, we're going to see a lot. Just this, this community is just going to grow now. It's going to get bigger than it's ever been before uh, with people um that have never seen my games before and i'm very excited to to welcome them yeah yeah it's got to be a, a thrill when you see a youtuber like uh chris danker playing your game and and going through the whole career mode and 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 the booking features of uh of your last game too yeah yeah P people like chris did a lot to uh to, to help promote um wrestling revolution 3d because you know millions of people discover the game through people like that who probably wouldn't uh, have otherwise they, they would have normally expected him to be playing a wwe game um so to see him play um one of my games it really put a lot of uh, new eyeballs onto my games yeah absolutely um as far as you know my impressions of of what i've got in front of me um two oh, it's really two things one, the gameplay is, like I mentioned before, it's as polished as ever. But one thing that I've already you know, gotten some experience with is the move melding aspect of it. And, you know, a lot of wrestling games, you know, you can get a double team move if you press grapple and, and your uh, partner presses grapple at the same time simultaneously or, or close to that. But here you can actually literally combine moves. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, pick someone up throw them to the other person and then, you know, they can hit them with whatever move they, they picked out. Um, and I think that's something that's going to become very influential for this game down the line. But where did you come up with the idea to do that? Well, my favorite thing about, <clears throat> about, um, about these games is, is just thinking of all the different ways the human body can interact with another human body. And especially in a game, I don't have to be realistic. So I can do all these, you know ungodly things that you would never see in a real wrestling match and 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 i put a lot of effort into this animation system where anything can happen at any moment i put a lot of effort into making it segmented it's like they're like lego bricks all these different frames of animation so i can cut into a move at any point at any time connect it with any other move at any point at any time and it will somewhat smoothly fill in the gaps and and that just that to me is what is so great about wrestling is just the physics of it the physics of these two humans finding ever more creative ways of hurting each other and now i as a developer can be part of that process and i can just 
you wouldn't believe how many hours I just sit there thinking of all the different ways of countering a Hurricane Rana. How can a Hurricane Rana combine with a power bomb to do this and then that? And then at that point, if he's on the ground and he does that and he lifts his leg there, I, I, it's like solving a puzzle, thinking of these hundreds of different ways. And, and we're still only halfway through it because every time I add a new move, I'm going to add a new counter to that move and a new hybrid version of that move and a new combined version of that move. So every one little move I add is going to blossom off into about five different directions. Yeah, it's something that I've already you know seen a handful of times and mm -hmm. something that I think is going to you know get you very far with the uh, streaming community. Anybody that wants to pick up this game and play it, they're going to you know, put put together, you know, compilations, I think, of all the crazy, crazy, uh, you know, recipes they can come up with for, yeah, for that's, how to that's, hurt someone. That's another thing I love about the Switch is that recording feature. Because in the old days, I would have to predict that something was going to happen and or hope that something was going to happen. Now I wait for it to happen, hit record, it's, it's done, it's, it's sealed in history. And oh, I've enjoyed that a lot. It's made my job a lot easier. That's why you've seen so much more video from me is because... The Switch is giving me more video every time I play a match. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I think the other thing that um, that really struck me is the uh, the uh, changes you've made to the character creation. Yeah. More layers, more things you can do with hairstyles. And again, I think people are going to have a much easier time with this game more than any other game you've ever done with, yeah. you know, creating their favorite wrestlers um, to a T yeah. um, and, and really being able to you know, find the attention to detail that it's going to require that a lot of people, you know, are going to really take to with that aspect. Yeah, I put a lot of effort into that. It's always a compromise because you can't have everything. I mean, I, I am in awe of WWE's creation suite. They do that very well. Um, I, I will never match the things they can do um, with clothing and with the human body. But uh, I've tried my best. Um, Unity did open up some new possibilities of... of of changing the structure of a, of a of a model instead of replacing it which was a big difference because i can i can change how fat someone is i can change um that, that's where the hair came from i can change the shape of the hair without replacing the hair and so it's a completely different um way of looking at the same thing and it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me and and we're still there's still going to be some developments there i've still got to take a look at facial hair and how larger facial hair can be added to it and change the shape of that um and we're going to see some new weapons and some new furniture that's interactive to that to that extent and that can be dented that's where you saw the dented chairs because i can just change the shape of anything i want to now internally it's called um blend shapes it's called um morphing and um yeah i'm i've only scratched the surface of what will be possible there yeah, was very impressed um, uh, with that, and I think that you know, you, you know, it's gonna be, it would be tough to ever match the WWE standard and the creation suite there, just because of the hardware they use and the and the the, the features they've added over time. But I think that if people can get eighty percent, ninety percent of what you know their favorite, that'll encapsulate what their favorite wrestler is. Yeah. Um, I think that's gonna be more than enough with 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 how tight the gameplay has become with your series. Thank you. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that struck me about this game, and real, I mean, not just this game, but it's really become a theme uh, of your career. The size. I've never had more fun with a game than I could download so quickly on the Switch. Yeah. I mean, um, typically, yeah. you know, you've got. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Um, some people, some journalists criticize me for that, saying it's it's only a hundred megabytes. I was like, I'm, I'm extremely proud that it's only 100 megabytes, that it's to, to squeeze that much functionality into a file that small. Um, because that's one of the reasons the mobile app did 50 million downloads is because 50 million people said, yeah, I've got room for a 150 megabyte game. Um, that's where all the success came from was the, the size of it. And I, as I said, I, I'm not a fan of games that weigh gigabytes. There's really, if a game weighs gigabytes i think you're just downloading the sound files of someone who wants to make a movie um, it's, it's not optimized for anyone who wants to play it um, whereas i like to think that i'm still 
uh, squeezing a game onto a Nintendo cartridge and all the compromises that that, that, that brings. It, it shows that your it so it shows that your priorities are right. Your priorities are on the gameplay. It is definitely fascinating considering the fact that I think you got it to under two hundred this time, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, it's, it's hundred and fifty it. now. It'll it'll probably go closer to four hundred megabytes when there's a whole city to walk around. But um no more than that. It won't it won't go more than five hundred megabytes. Yeah, well that I mean that's that's great. Because as it stands right now, you've got more characters in your game than megabytes. <laughs> I never looked at it that way. I, I I used to joke on Twitter that I um, games with 280 characters or more in 280 characters or less. But yeah, that's another way of looking at it is that I've got more characters than megabytes in the game. Yeah, that's pretty insane. And then you t you also I think you added at least one promotion to this game to kind of you know add to your character limit. Um, um, Talk a little bit about the idea behind, you know, going that way with it as opposed to just populating the um, companies with more wrestlers. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, I did have to make that decision either. Uh, I was actually going to reduce the, the amount of companies, not increase it. I was going to reduce it and put more people on each one. But then what I realized was I wanted to see the entire roster on one screen. That suddenly became important to me. I wasn't happy with the scrolling to the side or up and down. I wanted to see the whole roster in one shot, which you can do now with a high resolution screen. It wasn't possible in any of the older games, but so yeah, and then, so that kind of brought the realistic limit to about 35 per screen. And so I had to make 10 rosters, 10 times 35, instead of maybe six with loads of characters. But but yeah, realistically, it would have been better to have big, um, it would have made my life easier to have um, big rosters, but fewer of them. Because every company I add is a lot of work. It's a lot more. It's another set of logos, another set of championships, another set of aprons and ring designs. But on the plus side, I got to parody a wider range of promotions, like an MMA promotion, like a, an NWA promotion, like... Um, and there's there's two different um, parodies of of American wrestling. There's the classic American wrestling, and there's the modern American wrestling. And so, yeah, there's pros and cons to to the way I handled that. Yeah, I think what you did was very clever here. Um, you've got um, Federation Online, which was typically the uh, company you would you would you know. Yeah, that used to be mine. Up. Yeah, and then you've got. Um, your AAW, your All American Wrestling, your uh, Rising Sun, Maple Leaf, Super Lucha, but then you've got um, a Wrestling Revolution brand, which is a callback um, to the uh, mobile games. Yeah. And then you've got Strong Style Wrestling, which in the mobile games, I believe, was your MMA yeah. promotion. So it's but all. Now, yeah. Now it's like the cutting edge promotion. And you've actually added the Weekend Warriors promotion, which is now the MMA promotion. Yeah, so it's very convoluted now. It's all rearranged. Any, anyone who got very comfortable with Wrestling Revolution 3D will be a bit um, shell-shocked making sense of it. But to new players, and there are going to be thousands of new players to whom this is all new, uh, they'll just take it in their stride and they'll just accept that Wrestling Revolution is the fictitious roster and uh, you know it's all been rearranged and... The strangest one is that Federation Online, that was 20 years my own creation, is now uh, a parody of WWE. And the, the I like to joke that they um, that they bought the rights to Federation Online when because when I first thought of Federation Online, it was an online um, like a, like a, like the WWE network. It was it existed outside of the TV networks, and it was this own little um, streaming service. That was the idea behind it. It was this little pirate organization. Yeah. And then the irony is WWE became that in real life. They had their own WWE network. So it just seemed quite logical that they would just absorb this this um, this online federation and they would um, they would just take it over. And so I gave that to them. And that just helped me double the amount of American wrestlers that I can parody. Yeah, that's the way I've always looked at it too. Um, even playing back then, 
you know, obviously the internet looked a lot different, but if I could like into anything, you know, I think the way I looked at it then was, you know, what if something like Twitch, for example, that, that would be like the TV deal for Federation online. Yeah. 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 That, now, that was my original vision. Yep. Yep. Um, and then you've obviously got, you parody real wrestlers in here and, um, I, I showed some of them to uh, my girlfriend. She was very impressed uh, with some of the names I have to say. <laughs> um, but you've also created a number of, of your own characters over the years. Um, and I, I think I, 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 we touched on that in our previous interview. But, um, you know, how do you, how do you sort of um, go about creating um, characters from scratch to, to incorporate in your games? Well, if, if it was up to me, I would, fill, I would happily fill the whole game with fictitious characters um, because – it's just I know um, I know the first thing people are going to do is try and make real people. So I just I just go halfway there with you. I take one step towards you. You take one step towards me. But I actually prefer fictitious characters because you can't fail to create a fictitious character. You can fail quite badly to create recreate a real person. You can fail to imitate someone, and I do ninety percent of the time. And I, so I hate it. I hate trying to make a real person because half the time it doesn't look anything like them. But it always looks like my fictitious character. And so I enjoy that a lot more. But um, it, coming up with the names is, um, is like a mental illness because I just wake up in the morning muttering random words to myself. Score, Ben, all Cobain, whack Just to trying to think of random words that sound good together. Uh, I think it's like that's how George Lucas does this Star Wars uh, characters, I think. Just trying... You, 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 you're just trying to think of just weird things that people have never heard before, because um, you can't you can't just call someone a normal name. It's too boring. You've got to just have something they've never heard before. Oh, definitely. I think I remember you telling me that Whack Axe in particular was sort of a happy accident oh, in yeah. terms of it was created. Yeah, because I was in in three D Studio Max when I was creating the model. I accidentally painted his whole torso pink. Um, and I just kind of like the way it looked. It just kind of struck me as that that's our Bret Hart. He's our Bret Hart. He's hes pink and black. And he's got this pink torso. And he's still got his black shorts. And, and yeah, I just find myself... And it happened again with this game. Um, a handful of people in the wrestling school, they were just kind of like randomly generated characters who I saw so often on a daily basis that they became normal to me and they meant something to me and i just kept them there out of respect just these um you know oddly dressed characters oddly named characters i saw them every day for nine months and i just thought okay you just deserve to be in the game you're part of it you're part of its development i'll just give you a spot I'll try and get you over <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think you've done a great job over the years intentionally or unintentionally getting some of these characters over um i could like they, a lot of them taking on a life of their own like yeah. you know sure I, I will you know input new characters into the game all the time whenever i pick up one of your games but i always leave a lot of them yeah you know, your whack ops your whack oz your um um Ackright is another one yeah. that comes to mind yeah uh, it's, it's, it's funny because people say why don't you add more slots and i'm like i did add the slots that's those fictitious characters you can just overwrite them oh we don't want to overwrite them we want to keep them and we want more slots <laughs> they are the slots yeah. i use them for you uh, so yeah yeah and i think when we talked last you mentioned that uh score bends was kind of like your seth rollins of the of the yeah I, I really like that the look of that guy yeah um I always play with him when I when I play the career mode. Um, yeah, I, I tried to get him over. Um, I, I think I made him one of the champions as well in this game. Yeah, he, I think he's the uh, the champion of developmental. Yeah, the the red Wrestling. level champion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is is there um, that kind of a character like for this for this new era of uh, M Dicky Wrestling games? Not an iconic character. There's just there's new characters that are very low level. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's nobody that got the got the big push. Nobody that got pushed up to the Wrestling Revolution roster to compete with Wack Axe or anything like that. I see. So um, you've mentioned that you know updates are on the way. We got one today. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to um, give you a chance now to maybe talk about maybe some of the things that people come to expect uh, from the new Wrestling Empire. We've only just scratched the surface of 
of the moves that were already in Wrestling Revolution 3D and we're gonna we're gonna equal that and I'm gonna move past it with lots of new moves um, some of which have never even been seen in real wrestling before uh, lots of moves in my own creation lots of moves from the real sport that haven't been added yet lots of new combinations of moves that we've never seen before so there's lots to unpack just with the in-ring action uh, there's going to be a six-sided ring there's going to be more storylines there's going to be a booking mode that's more ambitious than anything we've seen in any of my uh, previous games and then I'm going to try free roam, um, which could backfire. I could put all this effort into free roam just to find that people say, no, nah, I can't be bothered. I just want to just go straight to the match. I can't be bothered to walk to the curtain. I can't be bothered to go to the gym. I've <laughs> and so um, I'm half hearted about the free roam. I think I'm going to try my best, but I think people think they want it. But then when they're sat in front of it, they might say, uh, no, we're just going to skip this bit. But I'll try and make it so uh, so chaotic, so anarchic, and so interesting that they have to give it a go. I think that free roam is could be a, a very fun addition to this game. Um, how like how do you anticipate it being used though? Would it be like a um, a uh, a setting that you could go to if you wanted to like start an exhibition? Would it be something that you'll get automatically inserted into um, before every match you have? Like, how would that kind of? Well, it, it won't be called compul <clears throat> It won't be compulsory. It'll, it'll be like um, at, at the calendar screen. It'll either say proceed or roam, and then you'll press the roam button to um, pick up where you are in the real world, and you will either like walk to the hotel room to to do, to sleep or walk to the restaurant to eat you will walk to the gym to work out you'll walk to the medical bay to get medical treatment and you'll even be trusted to walk to the curtain to enter the match at the right moment and so it puts all these pressures on the player to do all these things that are happening automatically at the minute and i'm hoping to make it so seamless that you can take it or leave it so you can either press proceed straight to the match or you can walk yourself to the curtain and talk to some people along the way. Or you can skip to the next day or you can walk yourself back to the hotel room and go to sleep and choose when you're going to exercise, when you're going to eat. And somewhere down the line, diet might even become important. Eating the right foods at the, in the right proportion. Uh, will all, all of these different facets of being a real wrestler will become important. And so... Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to make it interesting enough that people do embrace it and do use the feature. And uh, we'll see how it evolves from there. Yeah, that's something that I, I, I mean, it hasn't, it's not unprecedented no. for wrestling games, but for everything that you've described, you know, bringing it all together like that is unprecedented. And I think that that's something that people are going to be very happy with. Um, yeah, I hope so. Going forward, another thing that, that did come to mind was, a lot of people, you know, I know you don't read the Facebook comments, but a lot of people were asking about um, the ability to um, talk to people in your career mode, like voluntarily. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure that'll be making a comeback very soon. Yeah, it's got it's going to come back in a basic form very soon. Um, when you when you click on the roster screen in the career, you will be able to click on a character and you'll be able to. Um you'll be able to either approach, you can already approach them to be a manager or a partner. You'll be able to approach them to arrange a match and things like that. And then that will kind of, there'll be a free roaming version of that where you literally try and hunt people down in the locker room and, and encounter them face to face. And I've got a few mechanisms that I know how it's going to work. And hopefully when I see it in front of my eyes, um, I'll, I'll still feel the same way about it. The other thing that um, that I was seeing was uh, people were asking about, you know, what what kind of possibility would there be to have like a like a title editor in a game like yours? Um, because we we are seeing some different belt designs that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I, I've at least managed to make it possible to change the color of belts, but changing the design of belts is um, is a very tricky process because it wouldn't have the logo of the company on it. That would be too much to have. Well, we've got 10 companies times four divisions. That's 40 different belt designs. <laughs> There's already a huge workload, a huge workload and a huge load to store in memory. It's not a good use of resources to have 40 belt textures that have to be somewhat high resolution. 
for something that you only ever see from a distance. It's, um, it's a lot of work for very little benefit. So that's usually where I draw the line. So I think I've taken belt customiz customization as far as I can, but what I might be able to offer is the ability to go in and customize the promotions and change their color schemes and change what color belts they have. Um, but the designs themselves, I can't imagine how I'll have a good enough variety of designs. There's only so many ways you can depict a gold belt. It's just, I mean, I struggled to create four different ones. I can't imagine creating 40. Yeah, but that doesn't stop companies like WWE from trying all these. <laughs> no. <laughs> if I was selling um, merchandise, yeah, maybe I'd be more inspired. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that I wanted to ask you about that uh, this game has done that you haven't really done in the past is unlockable characters um, yeah. and kind of incentivizing people to play through the career mode and unlock the roster that way. Um, what kind of led you to uh, making that call? Yeah, it was just something about it being a Nintendo game you know, playing Smash Brothers and seeing these characters kind of like slowly come into the, slowly becoming available. Um, it, it just felt like a good match for the for the environment to, to have this replay value where you, it, it's supposed to be entirely creative. There's nothing to do with microtransactions. It's nothing to do with grind. It's just, because they do fall away very quickly when you do work for a promotion. You just see them all within a few weeks. And um, I, I just wanted that discoverability where, where people enjoy coming back to the career mode and it's not, it would have been very strange if you just, you can start with anyone anywhere straight away out of 350 characters and there's nothing to discover and there's nothing to look forward to. I think I would have shot myself in the foot with a console audience if, um, if that was what they woke up to. Whereas I really think this buys me a few more months of people taking their time to see the game's secrets and then that gives me time to work on the game uh, with a little bit more peace. Yeah, it's an, it's definitely um, an interesting strategy, um, and one that makes makes a lot of sense, quite frankly. Um, and going back to the theme of this game being kind of you know accessible, um, convenient. Uh, one thing that I happened to notice was it's got touchscreen functionality, oh, of course. which yeah. you know on the Switch is something that's been fully utilized of course, to yeah. its full capability just yet. You never know what you're gonna get out of games. When it comes to the Switch touchscreen, some use them, some just don't that that could use them, but yours does. Was that difficult to implement? Oh no, that was that was day one. Day one, I'm bringing my mobile experience to the Switch. This is, it, yeah, day one touchscreen. The, all the menus were touchscreen. The in fact, I would go so far as to say it's the best way of editing. I I wouldn't advocate using the buttons to editing and doing all the color changes. I just I just quickly do the colors with touch um, and, and I touch the part of the body that I want to edit. It's all touch screen for me, um, all the menus. That's how I treat them. And um, yeah, that's, that's the good thing about my mobile experience. It just hit the ground running more of the same and adding the controllers. I'm not taking away the touch screen. It's, it's touch screen as standard and I'm adding the Nintendo controllers. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think it's brilliant, and I think that you know, as far as the uh, the editor goes, it's gonna go a long way with that. I haven't got, I personally haven't gotten too into that no. part of it just yet. You know, I've just been testing out the gameplay and just seeing how things run with that. But um, but again, I, I think you know, on day one, this is your most polished effort to date, and I think people are gonna have a lot of fun with this. And really, another thing that we didn't really talk about um, that I can just touch on real quick here is it's going to be probably the most multiplayer accessible game you've ever done. Yeah, definitely. Um, this just is, because. Yeah, this is the first time I've, uh, the first time I've uh, included four controllers as standard and assumed that people are going to play it that way. That You can tell with the match setup screen that it's all suddenly designed for four people choosing which character they're going to control. Whereas in the old games, it was this, this afterthought, this um, strange way of playing the game that only one person would would ever choose to do. Uh, so it's a completely different culture, and and the buying in as well. People can opt in at any time and join the match or leave the match, and th that was a huge game design challenge. But um, I'm quite happy with the way things turned out because I've had I've had bigger problems with Mario Kart and with 
with Smash Brothers than I've had with my own game um, here. I mean, we've had issues where a, one of my kids has walked out the room and we've damn near had to restart the console to, to get back uh, get back into a game. Whereas this is quite versatile in letting people check in, check out, and, and, and adapting to one to four players. Yeah, that was something I experienced a bit myself. I, I pressed a certain combination of buttons and uh, accidentally let the computer take over in one of my matches. And yeah, if you I press was... the back button, it, it means you don't want to do anything at all. You don't you opt out of the whole thing and it becomes a CPU uh, AI match. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, there are big things in store for uh, for this game and for you going forward. And it's going to be a thrill to kind of follow it along and, and see where things go. Um, I am, I'm, I'm just very excited to, to finally get this in my hands at this point and, you know, build on it as, are, as I'm sure you are. But, um, man, I have to tell you again, this was such a treat, uh, talking today and, uh, getting some more insight on this game. And I think people are going to take a lot away from this conversation. So yeah, very happy you. to do it. And and I wanted to thank you as well. Anything... Oh, yeah. I wanted to thank you for the, uh, for the positive write-up because I was going to cut a promo on you guys saying, how come nobody ever puts me in their top five dead or alive when they're talking about wrestling games? And then I scrolled down and said, Oh, Jack, Jack did. <laughs> so now I've got to cut a baby face promo saying, um, thank you. Somebody said something nice because, because you got, you got in there before it was cool. You said you wanted to do this interview before the trailers hit. You said you were saying good things about the game before the trailers hit, and then everybody else was saying good things after the trailers hit and after the game was launched. So that's why I wanted to do this interview with you. Yeah, you've been uh, you've been a supporter from the start. So thank you. Well, I'm thrilled with uh, all the positive response you've seen so far, and I'm sure that'll continue. So uh, can't wait to follow it along, Matt. And um, you know, thanks again for talking to me today. Cheers. Stay safe.